So first things first, how are you? I'm great, thank you. It's very good to hear. Now, before we get into Lucifer 5, the new album, uh, I would like to jump back to the beginning. And now you grew up in Berlin, and I read that you were kind of entering the, the death metal, doom uh, metal scene in the 90s. What kind of, what should I picture uh, of the death metal scene in uh, Berlin in the 90s? Well, Berlin has a very big rock and metal community uh, back then already. Um, but the death and black metal scene, of course, was very small back then. Mm. Uh, so everybody knew each other, but I guess you can say that for any city uh, sure. in the world. And um, yeah, I was like 15, 16 uh, when I got into that music and um, um, met my first metalhead friends. Um, and, um, you know, bands were meeting up at youth clubs and old bunkers mm -hmm. and stuff to rehearse. And um, yeah, I was kind of, I mean, I was not a growler, so I was never the lead singer of any of those bands. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, back then, you had like Paradise Lost Icon with female vocals. And that was kind of what I did, you know, in those mm -hmm. death and black elements. Um, that was before all these, um, you know, modern operatic, sure. sonic type of metal bands came about that I'm not so much into. It was it was just a different time. But it was a cool scene, you know, a lot of small bands. And um, my best friend back then, he brought a lot of bands from Sweden uh, to Berlin that are really big now and that were very small back then. You know, like I saw Emona Marth in front okay. of 20 people and, you know, like <laughs> Mayhem, you know, all the Norwegian black metal sure. bands, they all played in front of like really small crowds and um, that was cool. What attracted you to that scene, to that type of music, to kind of, because you mentioned uh, you were trying, did you know you wanted to be in a band and that you wanted to be a singer of a band? How did you kind of get involved in, in everything? Well, it started, I've always wanted to sing and I was, I always had an affinity to music. My mom always sang to me since I was born and she mm. plays classical piano and all that. And okay. um, the household, you know, there was always vinyl around my parents listened to you know, rock music from the 70s. My brother was a punk. He was 11 years older than me and he would make me like punk mixtapes and stuff like that. So there was always music um, being put to me. And um, so since my parents already listened kind of to hard rock, you know, like ZZ Top and Deep Purple and, um, you know, the Stones and that type of stuff, um, that was um, kind of my parents' music. So when I was a teenager... I consider that to be like a little dusty and mm. and not appealing to a teenager because that's what your parents like, right? Sure. And my brother was a punk. So for me, it was like uh, metal. And, and it started first with like my first shows where Metallica, Guns N' Roses, Dancing, wow. Alice in Chains, stuff like that when I was like 13, 14. Uh, so that got me into metal. And when I was 15, 16, then I went to like extreme metal, like death metal, doom, black metal all that stuff and I really loved you know um like Dark Throne Mayhem like the cool black metal bands um uh then there was of course the considered cringy black metal bands <laughs> like Quail of Filth came and Dimo Borgi and all that we we were kind of like you know my circle of friends were like making fun of that <laughs> because it was like different it was like um black metal with top hats and um latex pants which was uh what we thought um, for sissies <laughs> <laughs> so um, no but I, yeah. I find it interesting because you, you mentioned kind of that that musical yeah. education that you had from your parents and then onwards uh, yourself and then am i right in saying that it kind of came full circle where you started to uh reinvestigate the 70s and then those type of uh bands and music that came from that era Yes, absolutely. Uh, it took me some years, you know, mm. uh, uh, some years of, you know, I had black hair. My whole room was like black. Um, <laughs> I only wore black clothes and I was very like, I guess it's an age, you know, when you're 15, 16, 17, 18, where you're trying to find your identity. Right. And um, it, it was later in my 20s when I like opened up musically again. And I realized that my parents actually weren't so wrong, <laughs> at least in the <laughs> music department. And um 
yeah, I mean, meanwhile, they don't have a record player anymore. I have all their vinyl at home, you know. <laughs> okay. That. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I totally went kind of backwards. So from then on, you know, the development was kind of to, as the older I got, the more investigative, I would look back into where everything started with music. And I mean, by now, um, I'm mostly appalled by contemporary music. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think no matter what genre, most of the great stuff was done in the, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s. 80s for me, maybe some stuff in the 90s uh, when it comes to like, I don't know, death metal and so on. Um, but there's not so much modern stuff that I like. And part of the problem is the modern production of things and that things have become too uh, sleek and not organic enough mm. for my ears. What do you like about the analog way of recording and the kind of the live setting of it well, because of the, I, I agree I, I prefer uh, I, I miss a lot of the warmth in modern music it's very clinical it seems it's too perfect almost so so what is it for you that you like about the the old way of rec recording yes exactly it's kind of the human experience because um when you hear little flaws and um, crackling, you know, uh, sonically and so on, it just um, feels more close to the heart, warmer, like you say. It's more, mm -hmm. I can um, identify myself better with it. Uh, I find it more comforting. Um, <clears throat> I get bored when something is too perfect. Uh, I don't think um, there is total beauty in complete perfection. I agree, yeah. Well, I have one more question about because I don't want to delve um, in in the past too much. But uh, on your, I think it's Instagram bio, it says born in Berlin, died in L.A., resurrected in Stockholm. What happened in L.A.? Because I know you lived there for a, for a little bit. Right. I lived there for three years. Um, that's actually a very personal story. I think only my really closest circle okay. of friends and family you know what happened to me but something very horrible that I've never spoken to uh, in public um, because it's just a really long story but um, let me just say so much about it that um, I feel a little bit like I've been through the apocalypse because of mm. it and why maybe my lyrics and my humor is very kind of dark and um what's the right word for it um nothing can shock me anymore mm -hmm. let's say it like this but maybe it explains a lot um you know my affinity you know trying to find like comfort for it and romanticism in in death and so on and looking backwards so much um it was i i have quite some trauma behind me in life yeah, and obviously you don't have to talk about it if you don't want to. But um, did it change your songwriting then? Because you mentioned the, your your sense of humor, the way you look at things. Can you? I don't know how much music you wrote before that, uh, before you lived in LA. But especially once you started uh, in in the oath and and what you do now, uh, how much has it affected your songwriting? You think? Well, I mean, I have always been inwards looking and I have always had an affinity to, you know, the dark side of things. And um, I have been morbid. I mean, when I was a teenager with my love for metal came my love, you know, for hanging out on cemeteries, you know, loving mm -hmm. old churches and structures and chapels and old things in general um, uh, that has always been uh, my safe space somehow um, but I think maybe if I wouldn't have been through a lot of shit in my life then uh, I wouldn't be where I am right now so it kind of made me also you know and I think that's where the silver lining with um, bad experiences lies is that you it um, makes you grow as a person and makes you more emotional and maybe putting things more in perspective you know that small problems are really not big problems right. and um, if that was a stupid way to put it but I think you know what I mean 
um, <laughs> that you know, small things don't really knock you off your feet anymore, like they maybe would other people, because you've seen bigger problems. Yeah, no, it just reminds me, and I don't know if this is a good connection, but um, when the oath kind of uh, fell apart and you were very determined to keep going, so is, I, I, I can assume that this determination and just resilience is something that, that stems from there as well. Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, I have learned to pull myself, you know, by my own mm. hair out of the mire, kind of. Right. Um, to get, you know, like um, you can cry, you know, for a couple of days and then you dust yourself mm. off and you get up again and you soldier on. I think it's a mix of my mother telling me, pull yourself together. <laughs> And also knowing, you know, nobody's going to do it for you. You have to, right. uh, um, you have to, you know, roll your sleeves up and um, be a little bit disciplined. And um, I think it's important to have, because no matter how shit life is, you still only have this one life. And um, it can be very short. You know, you never know when it's over and you will be dead all eternity long. I mean, okay, people believe in different stuff, but um, uh, that's kind of, if you look at life that way, at least you will give it more value, even if things are horrible, to try to make the most out of it and to still kind of strive for um, enjoying it. And I, right. the, me, I, I do love life very much, like so much. That's why death is such a big um, theme always. Because it's very hard to grasp because death, it's such an ambivalent relationship towards death. You know, it can be, um, um, it's the greatest horror because you don't know what's going to happen and you can't defend yourself against dying and everybody you love will die. But at the same time, it's also a comforting thought, you know, that, um, for example, when things are shit in life, you know, you always know, well, one day I'll be dead and then it won't matter, you know. Right. <laughs> so, so you can see it both ways. Uh, yeah, there's a balance. And what I find interesting, with, uh, because you mentioned death, now I have to find a lyric, I wrote, I wrote it down. Um, I think it's from Slow Dance in the Crypt, but I'm not sure. Uh, there's no shame to put your arms around the memory. And what I find interesting, you mentioned death. And on this album, it feels, at least from my perspective, there's a lot of... Uh, the sentiment that death is not the end in a way, that there's always some f form of communication afterwards, or oh, maybe I'm interpreting interpreting this wrong, but uh, what gave rise to the themes on, on uh, Lucifer 5? Well, that song in particular, it's kind of, um, it's about imagining that the love of your life uh, dies, and then and then what, you know, it's, this person will never come come back. And it's kind of a, a dreaming of that person actually coming back. And that's the great thing about music. It's a tool to create your own world and to fantasize about things, you know, mm. and make them reality, at least for the duration of a song or, you know. Uh, so it's great to escape the world. And, and that's, I guess, what I do with all the music that I have been involved in. I just use it to escape the world um or to make it my way you know uh, the way i um i find it um appealing to live in or whatever um sure. but yeah i mean there's still so many angles uh and sides to explore you know about loss and like i said i'm still not coming to terms mm -hmm. with death and i probably will take um 10 more albums <laughs> no <laughs> i don't think we'll ever find the solution until we die ourselves you know that we won't know um it's just, um, for me, it's an endless uh, pool of inspiration, I guess. Yeah, it's, it's definitely very interesting to philosophize about or to, to think about. Um, what is your songwriting process kind of in general? Because I assume it's it's different for each song. But but what is your process then? Do you, do you start with lyrics first? Are lyrics something that you do last? How, how do you kind of figure out what you want to say in a, in a song? Yes, so in Lucifer, we've done different ways, but the most st standard way is that um, uh, Nika comes with riffs or, you know, with fragments or even with a full instrumental. And I sit down, uh, put this into GarageBand and um, I start singing and I, the lyrics are like 
apart from that because that I do later um, I kind of treat my voice like an instrument so I kind of compose a vocal melody and then when I have that so I might sing like gibberish which sounds totally ridiculous but um, or like um, just play some sort of lyrics uh, mm. they, whatever comes out in the moment just uh, just to get like an idea of melody and uh, and then I write the lyrics um, uh, so they fit exactly that phrasing um, though very often you know when I have um, when there is a song I get an idea what the song could be about and if not then it's great because I always have a folder full of scraps uh, of lyrics because mm. when something comes to my mind I write it down um, I made a habit of it because it's like you can sit in the car or you can lie in bed and you know uh, wake up in the middle of the night and you think of something or you had a dream or you watch a movie and it inspires a thought and and so I always write everything down and um, when I yeah when I've, I'm done kind of composing the vocal melody then I you know I already know okay this song is going to be about this person maybe intertwined with that other experience because sometimes it's like mm. different things morphing into one song uh, and and then um, yeah, I try to come up with it in the moment. And sometimes um, I look back into all the things that I've written down, you know, like little rhymes and little like words and scraps and stuff. Um, uh, but there there are also songs on the album, two of them that were written between Linus Björklund, which is our guitar player. Um, him and I wrote two songs together. One is uh, "Riding Reaper" and the other one is "Strange Sister." Okay. And there's even one song, and that's the first Lucifer song where I wasn't involved at all. Um, it's um, "Maculate Heart." Nika has written okay. that completely um, alone, and it's also the first time I let somebody else write the lyric. Um, he wanted me to write my own lyric, but um, because he did the vocal melody, which usually he doesn't do. I was like, this fits so well. Um, I had a go at it and I thought, no, this his lyrics for that one are good. So um, I used to say I write all the lyrics in Lucifer, but apparently not anymore. <laughs> Once done by Nika. And we've done it other ways around too. Um, we had it before on, on another album, you know, where I wrote a song like on, on the keyboard or something and um, where I've done the whole writing or... I gave Nick a vocal melody that I recorded into my phone on the plane. Uh, and then he wrote the music around it. Okay. So we've done it different ways. Mm -hmm. mm. Singing, well, I want to go to Immaculate Heart then, because singing a song uh, like that, how do you get the emotion right then in the studio when you're recording vocals? Well, the great thing is we have our own studio. Mm. And... Um, um, it's just out here, actually, uh, like 20 meters away from the house. Mm -hmm. And um, we have the luxury of being able to go to the studio whenever it feels right. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, if tonight at 2 a.m. I want to all of a sudden record vocals for a ballad, then I can put on my bathrobe like the big Lebowski and, <laughs> you know, <laughs> march over to the studio and I can record it myself. Uh, which is great because when you're alone in the studio, you also don't feel like you waste anybody's time or somebody like the clock is ticking and you have to like um, you have somebody breathing down your neck or whatever. You can just take your time and I can record as many takes as I want and then I can edit later, you know, or Nika edits. Um, so that's really good. Mm. Mm. When did you kind of... Well, because I can imagine if you have a process like that, when do you know you're you're finished? Because you can kind of keep re-recording things or keep tweaking things. So, I, and I I don't know if this is a question for you or for for Nika, but um, when do you kind of know? Okay, now now we're done. We should should stop messing with it. Well, usually I already uh, that process is already kind of finished when you finish the demo. So okay. um, often, you know, um, when I show Nico the finished vocal with lyrics, that process usually is already kind of taken care of in the de during the demo recording. Uh, sometimes when I'm like, oh, shall I do this melody or shall I go that way? Then I record both and I show it to Nico and we discuss what's better. 
Um, or sometimes because I like to overcomplicate things and make too many different, like one verse is completely different than the next one. And Nicke likes to simplify things. He's always like, no, just do the exact same melody as the first one. I'm like, that, but that's so boring. Uh, and, and then he's like, no, but it's, uh, it's good. <laughs> so I had to learn to kind of let go and simplify stuff. Um, and I keep that in mind. I kind of know now... Uh, what he would say to me and um i also learned a lot about songwriting over the years now with the albums that you kind of get a feel like this is it that's that's where i stop yeah i mean this is album number five and you've made music before that so uh, you start picking up things i suppose you kind of start to to figure out what you like and and, and what works and what doesn't exactly um, the last thing I want to talk about is is playing live because uh, you played in the US uh, last year. You're going on tour in Europe in February, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. um, what is for you? And I don't know if this is different from from when you started in music, but what what do you like about touring? What what is the appeal of going on the road and being in front of people? I used to hate playing live because, uh, believe it or not, I'm actually very shy okay. and I'm some sort of hermit. You know, mm -hmm. I. Uh, uh, I know I come from big cities, but now I live in the country and I kind of during the pandemic realized more and more uh, that I'm a total weirdo and not a people person. And I probably have some sort of condition undiagnosed, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> uh, but what I do like is because it's easy to forget um, the other end of it. So we record here by ourselves and nobody knows what we're doing. Not even the record company gets a say or a look like a preview into what we're working on. And it's basically just, you know, uh, Nick and I and the guys that know what's going on. And then you kind of forget the world outside. You're like in your little bubble. So, you know, I just realized this again when we were on the US tour and we haven't been to the US for some years. Um, so you come out and all of a sudden you look into all these faces in front of you and like the first four rows or whatever, they're all singing along and they're looking at you like they know you and they smile at you. And it's like, it's kind of shocking, you know, it's like, holy shit, you know, I was just sitting alone in my little like hermit um, office, you know, writing lyric, writing these words. And now all these people are like say saying these words back to me and it, you get like a shiver down your spine and it's um really moving it actually um almost makes me cry you know thinking about it and also in the moment when i see it because it's like then you feel the human connection that mm. you sometimes forget you know because it becomes so anonymous so um yeah it's it's awesome and also you know i learned to like to to love playing live uh, because the music becomes a totally different animal life. And um, I don't know if you've seen us, but I think we've we've gotten quite okay as a live band. Um, it's different. It's a lot more rock and roll. It's a lot, you know, like more intense. Um, I've heard people say um, that we're better live than on record. And I take that as a compliment. Um, but then, you know, you never know what day you catch a band on. If everybody's sick and hasn't slept or mm. something, <laughs> then it could also be a shit show. <laughs> but I think we're, we're not too shabby live. And um, that is also really fun, you know, when you like you kind of live in the music and you hear everything loud and you feel everything. Um, and I love singing. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's those two things, you know, the, the people and to actually be in the music. Yeah, and I think uh, we talked a little bit about uh, old school way of recording live and analog. I, I think one of the things about playing live, the fun thing, I mean, I'm not a musician, so I don't know. But the fun thing I would think is that there is a sense that something might go wrong. There's there's this tension in a, in a way or there's this, this uh, yeah, the, the excitement in a way that you don't really know what's going to happen. And I can imagine that's very fun as well. That's totally fun. And we are a band that's kind of spontaneous. I mean, we will have a set list, of course, but, you know, there's a lot of bands, for example, that write down what they actually say and when. We right. don't do that. 
So it's like, and I'm not good at talking to audiences. So it could be <laughs> because I kind of always wing it that um, either it's funny and entertaining or mm -hmm. it's super retarded and, and uh, silly and I'm hating myself in the moment or whatever. <laughs> so you never know what you get. Um, but, you know, it's it's sincere and it's um, it's in the moment and um it feeds of the audience you know if it's like a difference for example if you play in south america and people right. are very enthusiastic there it's easy to play a good show because you get that back you know but you come to germany and everybody's like too cool to school uh it's a lot harder to play to people who don't move you know <laughs> so no, and I, I think we are the, i'm from the netherlands and we have uh we have a tendency to be uh kind of don't move that much and we talk through a lot of the shows and stuff yes. so. <laughs> i have noted i i have noticed this uh when we play netherlands it's always a little bit more hard work but um yeah it's part of it and yeah. and, and then you see the acdc concerts of uh, uh south america and they're just co going completely nuts which is amazing i think they, yeah, they yeah. have the best crowds in south america i think they do it's very fun it can yeah. actually get a little bit scary too because um, we, we you know, I've been accompanying Nicke, our drummer, on tour with this other band, the Helicopters. Sure. I also had the same experience with Lucifer, that after the show, you hang out backstage, you know, everybody cools off and has some drinks and talk. And then it's two hours later and you're like, okay, let's, you know, let's drive back to the hotel and get some sleep. And you forget that outside there's all these people waiting. And... Right. Um, and then it's like you need security to escort everybody individually because they'll be like, Nicka, Nicka, or Johanna, Johanna, you know, like like everybody's touching you Glad and you, yeah. wants photos and stuff, which is super sweet, but it can also be a little bit scary. Oh, Nicka right. told me a really funny story mm -hmm. when he was playing in um, uh, uh, I, Brazil, Mexico. I'm not sure. Uh, but it was with Entombed and he... Um, he didn't get the, he was on stage and he didn't get the cue of the security escorting the band from the stage to the dressing room so he found himself alone on stage and the stage got stormed and he ended up with no shirt oh, wow. <laughs> they literally you know took it off his <laughs> he survived luckily so that's good <laughs> johanna may i thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me Thank you so much. It was very nice talking to you. Great interview, man. <laughs> uh, thank you.